This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Oh crap, I shouldn't have burned all that coal. Oh crap, I shouldn't have made us gas dependent. Oh crap, I certainly shouldn't have subsidized the extraction of further fossil fuels. Uh, it's too hot today. Last week, Western Europe sweltered under a record-breaking heat wave. Temperatures of over 40 degrees Celsius were observed in the UK for the first time ever, breaking the previous temperature record by 1.6 degrees Celsius. 16,000 people were evacuated in France due to wildfires, and as of the time of recording, an estimated 1,700 people died in Spain and Portugal alone due to the heat. This particular heat wave was caused by an area of high pressure settling over Europe, itself caused by the jet stream which, to remind you, is the fast-moving river of air about 8 kilometers up over the mid-latitudes, ultimately caused by the temperature difference between the Earth's equator and the pole. And that determines much of European weather. Of course, you can read more about that in my book. The jet stream typically meanders over the mid-latitudes, acting as a wavy barrier to air masses moving around. Normally, it changes its shape pretty frequently, but over the past week or two, it got fixed in a particular pattern. Europe was trapped underneath a meander that allowed air from North Africa to spill forth, and prevented cooler air from elsewhere from coming in. This created an area of high pressure, effectively trapping air in place, which got hotter and hotter and hotter under minimal cloud cover, unable to be dispersed or displaced, which led to record-breaking deadly temperatures. But of course, the topic on everyone's lips is, was this heat wave caused by climate? It's important to distinguish between weather and climate here. Weather is what's happening in the atmosphere on a given day, while climate is the average over several years of weather. The temperature at a given location over several years will fluctuate something like this, caused by various natural factors. This is weather, the peaks up here being heatwave conditions and the troughs down here being deep freezes. Except what we've seen over recent years is a temperature record that looks more like this, with day-to-day -day variations on top of an upward trend. What may have passed as heatwave conditions in the past have become more common, and our current heatwaves are much hotter. The long-term average of weather, the climate, has changed. On this graph, the recent European heat waves are up here. They represent a natural fluctuation, a particularly hot day of the year, on top of a background warming trend caused by human emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And those two factors together contribute to temperature records being broken. So yes, the magnitude of this event was made possible by the climate crisis. And we saw this coming. A paper in 2020 analyzed the probability of temperatures greater than 40 degrees Celsius being measured in the UK and concluded that the probability of this happening in a world without human-caused climate change was so small as to be zero. Yet is currently something we can expect to see once every 100 to 300 years. But furthermore, that if greenhouse gas emissions are not curbed, we could see similar conditions every three years by the year 2100. And of course, even hotter temperatures on the particularly hot days. This is the worst pain ever! Go, go! Ah, 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 ah! This European heat wave was made possible by climate change, and it won't be the last. In fact, Europe has become something of a heat wave hotspot due to the climate crisis. A paper recently published in Nature Communications identified Europe as having experienced an increase in heatwave conditions three to four times greater than other places in the mid-latitudes. And they also identified the rather fascinating reason for this increase. Because I may have misled you a little earlier. The jet stream doesn't always take the form of a single river of fast-moving air. Sometimes it splits into two branches. I'm seeing double here! Four jet streams. The paper classified three states of the jet stream over Eurasia in July and August. A single jet, a double jet, and a mixed jet state. They found that the double jet state, which occurred about a third of the time, was linked to heat wave conditions. And an increase in the frequency of this double jet state was responsible for a large amount of the increase in heat wave conditions in Europe. If looking at Western Europe specifically, the increased frequency of the split jet state explained almost 100% of the increase in heat waves. So just to reiterate, heat waves in Europe are becoming hotter because of the climate crisis and more frequent because the jet stream is splitting into two branches more frequently. But what's causing that to happen? Well, 
The authors of the paper speculate that land in the Arctic now being so much warmer than the sea in summer is weakening the jet stream, and causing it to adopt this double jet state. That warming is, of course, due to human-caused climate change. I just want to make two additional observations here. Firstly, this instability of the jet stream causing more heat waves is kind of a parallel to a phenomenon I made a video about last year, where changes in the jet stream, ultimately caused by changes in the stratospheric polar vortex, have led to more frequent outbreaks of extremely cold air in winter in the mid-latitudes. So in Europe, extreme heat is getting more frequent in summer, and extreme cold is getting more frequent in winter. The temperature chart I showed you previously has an increased mean value now, but also has an increased variance. This is a great example of how climate change doesn't just mean everything getting hotter all the time, it means there's more energy in the system overall. And that shows up in changes in the dynamics and in changes in the variance of atmospheric variables like temperature and humidity. And secondly, on a practical level, heat waves getting slightly hotter and slightly more frequent isn't actually going to change all of that much unless you live somewhere where the infrastructure is kind of already in its limit. Like in the UK, for example, railways are simply not built to withstand temperatures greater than 35 degrees Celsius, so that slight increase in the maximum summer temperature actually does have a significant effect. The possibility that we need to be more concerned about isn't a single heat wave, or more generally a single extreme event, but a cluster of them. Europe can deal with a heat wave, even if it's slightly warmer than normal, and its firefighting services, its water reservoirs, and its health services can just about get by. What we don't know is if they could withstand a record-breaking heat wave, and then another one two weeks later. The increase in frequency, to me, is much more concerning than the increase in magnitude, because we have systems that have been designed with redundancies and with reserves to get through one extreme event at a time. We've never had to deal with multiple extremes back to back in the same location, whether that's Category 5 hurricanes or heat waves before. We simply don't know if we could cope. So what can we do? This splitting of the jet stream is attributable to climate change, and while split jet heat waves and other heat wave conditions will continue to get more frequent this century, we can limit how much more frequent and limit the possibility of devastating back-to-back -back heat waves by bringing down our emissions of greenhouse gases. As I've said so many times now, the atmosphere is a cumulative system. That means that anything we can do to slow the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere is worth doing. And the faster we can get to net zero and stop that concentration of CO2 from increasing, the better. If we don't, our children will view the events of the past few weeks as just a regular summer. I mentioned that the temperature difference between the Earth's equator and pole ultimately drives the jet stream. But how does that work? Understanding the way the atmosphere flows over the surface of the Earth is a study of physics, and beautifully explained in the Physics of the Everyday course on Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is an educational website and app that allows you to learn skills in maths, science and computer science. Now you may hear educational website and think, oh great, this is going to be like school, but you'd be wrong. Brilliant is all about two things, firstly making the learning experience fun with interactive exercises that allow you to play with a concept and see it in action right in front of you. Secondly, it's all about creating a learning environment where mistakes are encouraged. Because an environment where you're afraid to make mistakes is an environment where you're afraid to try. And that's not an environment conducive to learning. Brilliant stresses that it's okay, it's actually productive to answer questions and get them wrong. Because you learn for next time. It's a great way to complement traditional education, or pick up a new skill as an adult, whether that's understanding statistics, relativity, or neural networks. Brilliant is also constantly expanding their catalogue of courses, so whether you're a beginner, an expert, or anywhere in between, there's an interactive lesson to help you improve and learn. To get started for free and try out everything Brilliant has to offer, visit brilliant.org slash Clark, or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you to do so will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. With thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video. 
Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. I hope that you took something away from it and that it provided some context, if you live in Europe, to the sweltering experience of the past couple of weeks. If you did enjoy the video, please do share it with people that you think may also find it interesting, and it really does help to pop a like on the video and comment below with what you enjoyed about it. Here's some recommended viewing next, and that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.